Ok, uh, ciao, uh, grazie mille per uh, mi invita a la bella città, close enough, I guess. Um, this is my first time in Milano in about 10 years. I was only here once 10 years ago. I'm very delighted to be back. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for inviting me the previous time, and I'm sorry for all of the people who showed up last time and didn't find me here. And I'm astonished that you showed up again, if you did, <laughs> after you didn't learn your lesson the first time. Um, so, you know, since I scammed you the first time out of an appearance and you still showed up, it's clear that you guys are an easy crowd, an easy mark, so I can go ahead and scam you again. I know you came here for a Bitcoin standard talk, but you're going to get the cheap uh, knockoff of a fiat standard. Um, I think uh, discussing this with Giacomo and some of the organizers, I think many people have read my book and have uh, seen me talk before. And so I thought today might be the time that I would uh, present for the first time the genesis of my ideas for the next book, which pre preliminarily is going to be called the fiat standard, the debt slavery alternative to human civilization. So whereas the Bitcoin standard was the decentralized alternative to central banking, this is the debt slavery alternative to human civilization. And you know, if you didn't like the parts in the Bitcoin standard that um, blame everything wrong in the world on fiat money, you're going to absolutely hate my next book. <laughs> so let me start giving you some idea about uh, what it's going to be discussing. So first to begin with some of the concepts that were uh, discussed in the Bitcoin standard. What makes a good money? Generally, um, all examples of good money were hard money. Anytime you see whatever is used as money anywhere in the world, you'll find that it was the thing that was the hardest to make because it's the thing that holds on to value the most because it's less uh, likely to be produced in large quantities by others. And so by the end of the 19th century, there was really only one money all over the world, and that was gold. And that was the money that was being used pretty much everywhere in the world. And, you know, it's a simpler time. Um, in banks would hold other people's money, and um, the use of a central bank was primarily to clear the money and the payments between uh, countries or between cities. It was just a faster, more efficient way for settling payments between different places. So instead of you having to send your gold coin to America every time you buy something from America, a bank here would settle with a bank in America. And you know, they would settle all the transactions of everybody sending money here and there. At the end of the day, or week, or month, or year, they'd move um, a specific sum of gold to settle the balance. But they didn't have to move the gold at all times. Um, and uh, money was won across the world. So foreign exchange at that time, as I mentioned in the Bitcoin standard, was as simple as the exchange from metric to imperial units. You know, the, the, the Italian lira was this many grams of gold and the French franc was that many grams of gold. And that was it. That was how it all was always going to be. And so there was no foreign exchange market where people speculated on it any more than we have an exchange market where people speculate on what's going to happen to the inch or the centimeter. It's always going to be the same. I mean, not always, obviously, there were changes, but it was quite reliable for the most time. Now, the political implication of this was that governments had to earn money to spend it. Government couldn't just print the money that it wanted to spend, as they do right now. And so if a government mismanaged this budget, if it spent more than it earned, it would go bankrupt and it would fall. And it would fall either to domestic rivals or to foreign rivals. And this was quite common. If you didn't know how to run your government well, you didn't have a government anymore. People took over power from you because you went bankrupt and you can't just print money. And so you had to be fiscally responsible as a government because if you weren't, you were no longer a government. And there was no such a thing as monetary policy. It's a beautiful idea. Imagine a world with no monetary policy. It's amazing. Then World War I happened. And like everything bad in the world, it started around 1914. And governments essentially took over central banks of course, as a temporary measure to finance wars, but it's now been 106 years or so, and the temporary measure is still there. By 1971, governments had essentially entirely taken over the monetary system and replaced gold with their debt as money. And that's really the birth of what I like to call the fiat standard, the idea that government fiat is what uh, constitutes money. And so if you think about it, you know, you could say governments took over central banks. Others could say that banks took over governments um, and established the central banks. But the, re the, the details of who wore the pants in this relationship are not really important. 
I think what is really important for us, instead of blaming people or trying to um, figure out whose fault it was, is to just deal with the consequences of it. And the main consequence is the, what I like to call the ugly bastard child from this unholy marriage, and that is the uh, entity of government-enforced banking monopolies that you see all over the world, or which I will refer to as GBM for short. Government-enforced banking monopolies, the idea that in every government, in every country, there's one government, and that government only authorizes one uh, group of uh, banks to function um, as banks. You can't be a bank unless you have the um, legitimation of your government. And that's it. All government, all banks are under the supervision of the central bank, and each country has its own central bank, and that's just a monopoly system. You cannot be a bank outside of these. And so what this uh, entity does, it is, you know, it, it, it's this um, Frankenstein monster that's part government, part bank, part private sector, part public sector. Nobody really knows. It's, it's very obscure in each country whether this is a private entity or a public entity, but generally, whether it's, whatever it is, it's generally none of your business. Um, unless you happen to be one of the people um, whose parents are involved with this. It's just this entity, though, has these four main functions that I think if you really want to understand a lot of the economic problems that happen around the world, you have to think about the conflation of these four functions into one entity. And just to try and think about the implications of having one monopoly entity in charge of all of those four things. So, you know, if we had a government monopoly on apples, we can... Uh, we can speculate about the kind of problems that this would create. Now, what about if we have the government, uh, the GBM, or the Government Enforced Monopoly on Banking? Well, this, this institution of the central bank and the banks and the government agencies that regulate them, it has a monopoly on determining the money supply. You know, the only money that is allowed legally in a country is what the government says is money, and the supply is determined based on, um, uh, based on the decision of this entity. Similarly, it has an a monopoly on international payment settlements. So if you want to send money from Italy to any other country in the world, you have to go through your local central bank. There's no way around it. There's no other way of sending money uh, across national borders until 2009, of course. But there was a monopoly on international payment settlements. If you wanted to send money across the world, you had to go through your local central bank. And then it was also the monopoly regulator of banks. So it was the only entity that could decide who gets to be a bank and who doesn't and what banks are supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. And also, it holds the reserves of banks. So the central bank in each country holds a big chunk of the reserves owned by each individual bank, which constitute your deposits and your savings. And so it holds a fraction of the wealth of everybody in the country, and it regulates how the banks can deal with the wealth of all the, other, uh, all the rest of the wealth that is held in banks. And it has a monopoly on the regulation of those banks. And then the cherry on top, of course, is that it uses its command over all of this wealth in order to lend to the government. It's a perpetual, unconditional lender to the government. Um, central banks are always buying government bonds, always, it's all, which is effectively lending to the government. And so this entity, when you think about having a monopoly on all these three functions, plus having a blank check of loans ready to be given to the government at all times, I think that, uh, that really helps us visualize and, and, and make uh, vivid the, the, the kind of problems that would emerge from this. And so if we, what is this? Hmm? Hmm. Um, things not moving. Okay, here we go. And so these are the four functions from the previous slide, but I thought I'd keep them here. So think specifically about the central bank's cash reserve, the amount of money that is held at the central bank. And think about the four functions that follow from these four functions, um, about what is done with that cash reserves. The first thing is that it backs the local currency with hard currencies. And so each central bank has hard assets other than its own currency that it uses to settle with other countries because other countries are not going to accept your currency. They want hard assets that um, they can spend. And so that usually is a few hard currencies um, plus gold. And so the central bank's cash reserves includes gold and hard currencies. It is also used to settle international trade. It is also used to back all banking deposits. And so all of your bank uh, 
All of the money that you have in a bank is essentially backed by money that exists in the central bank, which is the same money that backs the hard currencies, that backs the local currency and is used to settle all international trade. And also, it's the same money that is used to buy government bonds to finance government spending. So when you combine all of these four functions together, one must wonder what could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, you're just putting it in the hands of one monopoly entity and you know you have government in charge. When has government ever missed, uh, have, has a government ever abused the trust that it has been given? So when you think about all of this, you know you see all of your savings, all of your deposits, all of your international trade, all of your remittances, they have to go through one entity, one entity only, that has a monopoly, protected by government. You know you can't just compete with them. You can't set up your own bank outside of the government's regulatory system. Even if all of your clients are very happy to deal with you, you're not allowed to compete with this monopoly. And use all of that money, put it in the hands of one entity, and then lend to the government practically unconditionally. Let's face it, when has a central bank ever said no to a government? So everyone's money is in the same pot as the government, essentially. And there is, asterisk, until 2009, there is no alternative. There's, you, you can't just put your money in another bank. You can't say, I don't want to play this game. I want to have another uh, banking system for me. So if you want to bank, save, or trade or send money internationally, you must go through the government-enforced banking monopolies. There's just no alternative to this anywhere in the world. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, a lot. So I made a list of 11 things that have gone wrong as a sort of um, initial brainstorming for the ideas that I would like to include in the next book. And so the first and most obvious one is ever-growing government deficits. Well, you know, the term deficit without tears has been uh, coined um, previously, and I think this is a good way of thinking about it. Governments no longer really have to balance their books because anytime they run out of money, they can just have their central banks use all of society's wealth and savings to buy more government bonds. And so your government is now able to um, essentially exercise fiscal irresponsibility with much more freedom than it could under a hard money standard because now it controls all the money that exists in society. So all of society's financial capital is in that monopoly entity and all of that financial capital is backstopping government debt, is buying up government debt and sub subsidizing government spending. So government spending isn't constrained by its own income as it was under the gold standard when the government had to earn as much money as it spends or roughly around it and balance its books. You're no longer constrained. Now you, what restricts it is actually the sum of all of society's financial capital. And so if you look at an example of a society where you witness hyperinflation, you see the limits of this model, that a government can continue to spend all the way until all of the value of the uh, savings in the banks collapse and all of the value of uh, the, the money that members of society have in their bank collapses. And this was not really the case um, previously. You know, in, um, under the gold standard, it, you know, a government could go bankrupt or a government could fight a war, war and lose the war, but in its main cities, people would still be living their lives normally going on and banks would still be operational. In other words, if you were an Italian citizen um, under the gold standard and Italy fought a war and lost it, or the government went bankrupt, that was the problem of the people in the government. And your bank account had nothing to do with that. Nobody came and took your bank account because your government went bankrupt. That was between you and your bank. And the government, if it wanted to get money from you, it had to tax you and taxing obviously is much more complicated than just printing. With printing money, they devalue the money in your bank account without you having to do anything. Whereas uh, with, the, um, with, with the hard money standard, trying to get the money out of people's hands and out of people's bank accounts was much trickier. And so the only real go limit on government spending is the destruction of all of society's wealth. Some, some governments have succeeded in achieving this, Others are on their way, but they're all trying. We have to give them the credit, you know, because what matters in life is not whether you fail or succeed, it's that you try. And all the governments are doing their best to uh, succeed in this. And now we even have developed new breeds of cranks in economics who fundamentally believe that government spending has no opportunity cost, that there's no cost to it because, well, the government can print money, and so therefore we can 
You know, a government is just like the scoreboard in a stadium. We can make more goals in the stadium. You know, the San Siro is never going to run out of goals. They just update the numbers on the board, right? That's how it basically works. And um, people genuinely believe this. Uh, another impact is the continuous currency devaluation, which is the flip side of the ever-growing budget deficits. So how are the deficits financed? The central banks use, uh, essentially use the reserves that they have to, back, to, to buy more debt from the government. So essentially, that creates more money supply, and that leads to the devaluation of the currency. And so we're always witnessing um, money lose its value in the long term. Some countries are more successful at destroying the value of their money than the others. But again, they're all trying, and we have to give them credit for it. And of course, you know, this, the, the, the Keynesian scam here, of course, is that you can always buy happiness today if you're willing to sacrifice tomorrow. And of course, most governments are made up of people who are very happy to sacrifice your future for their happiness today. And so, you know, the, the, the fundamental way this Keynesian scam works is you lower interest rates, so that allows for more lending to take place. And of course, you know, when, in, in this system, debt is money. And so when you create more loans, you're creating more money. And so there's always this incentive for creating more loans, which leads to a reduction in the, uh, an increase in the money supply, which leads to the reduction in the value of the money. So money is constantly losing its value, and that's, of course, discouraging saving and incentivizing spending and borrowing. And that's related to the concept of high time preference, and, uh, which I discuss in detail in the Bitcoin standard, the idea that when your money is constantly losing its value, you are less capable of saving for the future, and so you're less capable of planning for the future, and so you become more and more present-oriented. And that's, I think, I mean, I, I, if you've read the Bitcoin Standard, you, you, you'd see I have, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced uh, the, of the fact that in the 20th century we've witnessed more and more of a rise in people's time preference, uh, and, I, and I, I think it's ultimately due to the fact that money is losing its value. Um, thirdly, and related to that, is the ever-growing size of governments. All banks' deposits are essentially used to finance government spending. And so, effectively, government can forgive all of its errors using your money. It can use your money to get it out of any hole. It's protected from the consequences of its actions um, by your money, which means that all of their stupid actions can continue to magnify. So. Um, people today don't understand the concept of opportunity cost when it applies to government spending. People think that you know, government just prints money and therefore um, everything that we can think of that is good should be financed by government. If you look at elections, if you follow what happens in an election, you'll see that nobody um, or everybody champions every cause. You know, nobody says, no, we can't afford this, we're not going to spend money on it. Everybody wants to spend money on everything and they just differ about how and where they want to spend the money on it. But, of course, it's, it's political suicide for any person to go and say, I don't want to spend money on this thing. Because then your opponent is just going to say, oh, he hates this thing. You, know, you don't want to spend money on uh, children's hospitals, it's because you hate children. You don't want to spend money on roads, it's because you hate roads and you hate transportation. And, of course, the concept of uh, there being an opportunity cost involved is not easy to grasp when the money is just so easy to create and when we've had many generations that have just seen government continue to spend more and more without uh, much apparent uh, destructive consequences. So the result is the growth of government in so many different parts of life. In other words, you know, government is involved in most of the world in electricity, in water, in garbage collection, in children's health, and much more. Why? Not because it should, but because it can. Because they have the ability to print money, and so they can interfere in any market. And that's good for them if you're in power. This allows you to just have access to a lot of wealth, um, but not necessarily good for you because it restricts your freedom in all of these markets in, in many ways. A fourth consequence is war, empire, and despotism. Under the gold standards, governments fought until they ran out of gold, until they ran out of money. Each government had a treasury that contained gold, and if they started fighting too many wars that were stupid, that were losing, that were unnecessary, the gold in their vaults would run out, and when the gold runs out, they have to stop fighting. Fiat fixes this. The fiat standard fixed that by basically allowing them to continue to fight with all of their citizens' wealth. So as long as they have a printer, they can just continue to print, and the central bank can continue to buy their debt, and therefore, 
they continue to finance war operation by reducing the value of the money that people hold in their bank accounts. And that was not the case under the gold standard. And it's also no coincidence that when you think about all of the tyrants that came about in the 20th century, even before that, they, you know, we've never had a mass murderer on the gold standard. All the mass murderers in history came on this kind of monetary system because mass murder is an extremely stupid thing to do in a free market. Human beings are productive things. It's much better to farm them than to kill them. Just get them to work and tax them like normal kleptocratic governments do. But if you go crazy and you start wanting to kill them, you know, the, the only way to finance something like that is to have access to uh, essentially the bottomless pit of wealth in your banking system through the government banking monopoly system. And so we see, we see all of these um, phenomena continue to appear more and more. You know, there's, uh, think about when you think about genocide, when you think about mass murder, pretty much all of the names that spring up, uh, you know, look up their monetary system that they employed and they almost always had a very inflationary and usually hyperinflationary uh, standard. Which brings us to number five, hyperinflation, which is a unique achievement of the fiat standard. No other monetary standard can achieve quick collapse within a few weeks, destroy the value of all the money in the hands of everybody. Uh, you know, seashells do better than that. Seashells hold on to their value much uh, better, even though they could lose their value significantly over time. They, you know, only government is capable. I think there was a quote by Mises that once he said, government is the only institution that can take a perfectly fine piece of paper, put some ink on it and make it worthless. And really, only government can achieve that. The 57 cases of uh, hyperinflation recorded, uh, all of them were in, uh, or 57 were in the 20th century, and only one was before the 20th century. But even that one was um, in, in France under a system that was very similar to the system that we have here. Uh, number six, uh, also extremely relevant to this, is the issue of capital destruction and capital flight. And if you think about it, when your money in the bank is expected to lose its value, when it's likely to continue to devalue, you have less of an incentive to save, less of an incentive to put your money in the bank, less of an incentive to accumulate capital. And also you have more of an incentive to flee your country and go take your capital elsewhere. And so throughout the 20th century, we see so many examples of people taking their money out of their own country and go, trying to send it somewhere else. And then of course, governments react by imposing uh, capital controls. And that applies to financial capital, but also to other kinds of capital, physical capital and also human capital. Um, essentially, anything that's productive, it, becomes under the, it comes under the influence of this monopoly banking system and, and, and the ability of government to extract wealth from it. And that destroys the incentive to accumulate capital and creates more of an incentive to escape. And of course, when they impose capital controls, it not just gives people less of an incentive to uh, accumulate capital, it also gives them less of an incentive to bring their capital into the country in the first place. So they're quite counterproductive in the long run. And of course, you know, under the gold standard, this was not common. It was not common that people imposed capital controls. It was very hard to impose capital controls because there was very little border um, control and people could just move their money around at, at all times. And then seven, we see the balance of payments and the trade problems. So governments start societies now start developing trade deficits, and this somehow becomes the problem of society overall. Our country is importing too much, and we're consuming uh, too much. We were importing too much, and we're not exporting enough. And somehow this becomes a problem for us as a nation that we, that the government needs to tackle on behalf of us as a nation. These sort of things weren't the problem under the gold standard, usually because the amount of money that was held in people's hands was almost unknowable um, because it was, uh, you know, anybody could hold all their money that they want. And, uh, you know, the, the movement of money from one country to the other was something that was done between the people who, did, who lived across those two countries. It was much less of a, um, a public issue or of a government-based issue. And so, um, the impact of this is that trade now becomes a political issue. And so as a result, we see in the 20th century a massive rise in protectionism and a massive rise in governments interfering in the movement of goods. And it's important to understand, as I discussed in the Bitcoin standard, that the problems of trade are monetary in their origin. The reason the Great Depression um, came through a trade war was the monetary origins of the uh, Great Depression. When 
people's money is losing value, people have an incentive to spend it quickly. And one good way to spend it is to e send it abroad or to export it. And so when people, you know, if you can't buy foreign currencies, well, at least you, maybe you can buy foreign things. And so people want to dump their currency so that they can get things from abroad when the value of their currency is declining. But of course, that just creates more selling pressure on the currency and therefore makes the government become even more strict about enforcing capital controls and about enforcing trade controls. And all of these lead to more uh, political tensions that can lead to uh, wars. And of course, there's also the problem of the exchange rates that are constantly shifting all around the world, making trade much more complicated uh, between countries. Uh, the eighth thing is that banks are essentially protected from market competition to a very large degree because there is, uh, they essentially have a, um, an oligopoly system. The central banks are largely owned by their constituent banks and you know, like any industry that is regulated, there is scope for capture and in banking it's, it's, it's quite obvious uh, that the rules are designed for the incumbents to the benefit of the incumbents at the expense of the outsiders to keep the outsiders out. And so central bank has an incentive to bail out the banks if they get into trouble and that means banks have an incentive to take on extra risk because they, they can essentially offload the downside to society. Government can print money and bail them out if they, um, if they become uh, insolvent or illiquid. And essentially, this leads to banks continuously um, devaluing society's money to their benefit. Um, it's, it's not just government spending that is devaluing it, as we see in many countries. You know, banks take on extra risk and then taxpayers have to bail them out. And this is pretty common. The ninth thing to see is just the emergence of kleptocracy all over the world as a governing model. Um, basically, being in power means you are in charge of all of society's wealth. You are able to dictate what happens with everybody's wealth because you control what the banks do with everybody's wealth and everybody has to put their money in banks and all of the banks are controlled by people in power. And so now the incentive to be in power is very strong, but particularly for the people who will want to abuse it. I mean, this is a system that is an advertisement to abuse. You come and take over and you'll be able to have control of all of society's money and, you know, use it to finance your re-election campaign. And essentially, you know, fiscal responsibility is political suicide. You can't just go and run on a platform of saying, I'm not going to hand out money to people. I'm not going to give every little girl a pink pony. If you do that, you know, you're going to lose to the party that promises to give every little girl three pink ponies, unless another party proposes five pink ponies. And so, you know, ultimately you can always bribe the electorate with their own money and people will see the pony and they won't think about the implication of the, you know, the, the devaluation of their currency five, ten years from now and they won't realize that they're paying extra for the pony in terms of the devaluation. They'd be better off just buying ponies themselves. Um, and this means governments don't really need the, or have much less of a need for the consent of their people when they govern. Under the gold standard, under hard money, taxing is difficult. And so if you wanted to take more money from people, you had to send tax collectors to go knock on doors and tell people, hi, we're here to take more money from you, which is a very dangerous job, to put it mildly. And the more you send them, the less likely they are to come back. And then the less they come back, the more resources and weapons that you need to dedicate to the process of taxing people. And eventually, you know, it, 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 once governments become too um, onerous in their taxation, it, the governing becomes unsustainable for them because it becomes too expensive and it becomes too hard for uh, people to... Um, it, it becomes too hard for people to comply and people start finding ways around it and people start um, going around it and that leads to just a reduction in the amount of money that the government makes. So either the government goes bankrupt or they reform or they get taken over by governments that do not uh, abuse their spending as much. Now today, not only do they have access to their own government, to their own people's money, but also they have access to the World Bank and the IMF and these international organizations that stand ready to lend to them at um, very large, uh, uh, in, in, on very generous terms at all times because these organizations, particularly the World Bank and the IMF, are uh, 
funded with unlimited capital from the U.S. Federal Reserve. You know, th they don't mention this uh, on their promotional brochures generally, but they are financed by the U.S. Federal Reserve. They have a credit line from the Federal Reserve. And so when Brazil or Argentina or uh, any developing country is facing uh, a financial crisis and it needs $30 billion, and they call the IMF, the IMF doesn't need to go and call other countries and say, hey, China, can you give us some of the money that we lent you? Uh, we have to give some money to Brazil. They don't have to go you know, uh, cut down on their staff salaries in order to make money to lend to the Brazilians. They don't have to do any of the things that regular banks need to do in terms of thinking about allocating capital and thinking about opportunity cost. What do they do? They call the US Treasury. They call the Federal Reserve. Hey, how are you guys feeling about Brazil these days? And if they say Brazil is cool, then sure, $30 billion, $50 billion, whatever. It's all fake fiat money anyway. It's not like it's real. And if Brazil is not cool, then you know, they don't get the money. And so what, is, what, what does this uh, do? You, know, you have these organizations that can lend out massive quantities of money, essentially at zero cost. There's zero opportunity cost for the IMF and the World Bank. And of course, you know, these are organizations that function with zero accountability, zero responsibility. Nobody has ever uh, faced any consequences for messing things up. So you give Brazil $30 billion and they take it and they carry out the genocide of Uruguay with it. Whoops, you know, you write a report and you say next time we should probably not give $30 billion to somebody who's going to do a genocide. And you get moved to some country in Africa and you give them $30 billion and you know, your career continues to go on. It's not like you have to pay the $30 billion from your pocket because it's not real money anyway. Um, and so these organizations have only one function and it is to lend. And so they're always lending. And essentially, uh, you know, the, the more incompetent your government is, the more the IMF and the World Bank will lend them as long as, they're, um, as, long as the US government is happy with uh, their um, uh, performance in other aspects. And essentially, the model that they tell governments is, Get rich and powerful by pillaging your nation's future. If you, if, if you are able to, you know, if you borrow money from us, you're going to have a lot of money and a lot of wealth. You don't need to tax your people. You just need us. You don't need the legitimacy of your people. You can just buy governments with our, buy guns with our money and use those to um, um, essentially enforce your will on your people. And so this is a model that selects for the worst kinds of people to get into government because it selects for the people who are willing to take on debt and burden their country's future generations with uh, more and more debt rather than people who want to, take the, to be fiscally responsible. So if you run for elections with the platform of I'm going to take $30 billion from the IMF versus somebody who's saying I'm not going to take $30 billion from the IMF, well, you're running with $30 billion of what looks like free money to your citizens. So you're telling them, well, I'm going to build roads and hospitals and give every girl a pony. And the opponent who's fiscally responsible sounds like just a cruel, um, uh, cruel monster because he doesn't want to give people all of those free things. And of course, you know, they don't tell you about the cost of it, which is going to come later. And of course, when it comes, you know, when your government is unable to pay those loans, there's zero introspection from the IMF and the World Bank about maybe we shouldn't have given them those $30 billion or something. Zero um, introspection about the role of it. There's zero responsibility, zero accountability. The problem was just that your government was bad. And so let's replace it with another government and give them another $30 billion. Surely this time, giving a government a lot of money um, will work, you know? And so. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, the final stage of this is when the government is bankrupt and it can't pay back the IMF and the World Bank. That's when the multinational corporations that are allied, that, that are well connected with the IMF and the World Bank, essentially come in and pick at the carcass of those countries. And so they'll have large swathes of, um, say, forest or natural resources that get given to all of these multinational corporations to, as a way of paying off the debt that those countries can't pay off. And it's just a system that keeps getting all of those countries into debt. And if you look at all over the world, you know, debt burdens are growing. And that's the final point of um, what the fiat standard does, and that is the universalization of debt. Just this idea that uh, if you look all over the world, whether it's individuals, whether it's governments, whether it's um, municipal governments, central governments, national governments, corporations, businesses, all over the world, everybody is in debt 
everybody's always in debt. The richer you are, the bigger the debt that you take on. And it's not the way the world always was. If you read books written before 1914, and contrary to what your university might teach you, there actually were books written before 1914. And if you read them, you'll see that you know debt was kind of a big deal. It, pretty much in all cultures and all civilizations, people hated being in debt. It was this thing of last resort. And it was not, uh, it was not culturally popular. It was not something that people uh, wanted to do. And it was, you know, the goal of everybody was to not be in debt and to be debt free. And yet today, you know, even the richest people still have a lot of debt. You know, they finance their businesses through debt. And it's interesting to think about why that is the case. And the answer is that in this kind of monetary system, in a system in which money is debt, we can think of debt issuance as being similar to gold mining. When money is debt, when you issue new debt, you're essentially creating new money. And so the bank that issues a loan in a fiat standard is similar to a gold miner that finds a new nugget of gold that increases the supply of gold that is available. And I think that's the key to understanding why debt has grown so much, because it, generating debt is a form of creating new money. And so everybody has an incentive to do it because there's a lot of money to be made from it. And so institutions that are able to issue debt are able to prosper enormously. And that's what explains why the financial system is growing, because effectively the financial system today is like gold miners under a gold standard. Every time a new loan is issued, new money is created. And so they have a big incentive in getting you to um, uh, take out more loans because that leads to more and more money creation. And if you think about um, modern businesses, and it, it, it's a joke that um, some people uh, say from, uh, so, uh, for, from business schools, you know, the, the, there was a time in which people made money by selling things. Now the point of selling things, the point of starting a business that sells things, is so that you have clients so that then you can give them debt. That's what you really want to do. So you look at, um, say, um, clothing retailers in the US, the, the amount of money that they make from clothing is almost insignificant. What matters for them is that they're able to give credit cards. That's really where the real business is. If they can give their clients credit cards, then the clients start borrowing from them, that's money creation. So essentially, every business is just a way to be, is just trying to become a bank, trying to issue debt, because the issuing of debt is effectively like the printing of money. We've been in a world that has been monetizing debt for the past 106 years, and debt has been more and more, uh, has been growing more and more because it is a form of money. And so um, it's an enormous incentive for everybody to get into debt, and it's really why all businesses that succeed, well, not all, but a very large percentage of businesses that succeed have to rely on debt because the, 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 you know, if you're trying to hold on to cash, if you're trying to operate from cash and from savings, your cash is constantly devalued. Whereas if you're running on debt, then every time you're taking out debt, you're effectively creating new money. And so the people who are creating new money have an incentive to um, give you favorable terms. And so, of course, uh, historically, you know, the Keynesian idea is that, well, this is when you... Uh, when, when, when you're uh, reducing the value of money, you're reducing the value of the debt, and that's good for poor people because poor people, uh, you know, the, the, it reduces the value of their debt. But of course, if you think about it, the burden of debt is much, much higher on the rich than it is on the poor. It is rich people that borrow a lot more than uh, poor people who have much harder time being able to borrow. And so, um, yeah, all of these really give us a way of understanding all of these consequences of mixing up the uh, wealth of individuals with the wealth of uh, the government. And I think when you think about the uh, global monetary system and the impact that it has, or when you think of the um, global poverty, you know, think about those 11 forces that have been at uh, play for the last 100 years and think about the impact that they would have on an economy. Particularly if you think about what are the ways in which economies can grow. It's really only through three ways that material living standards can improve. Capital accumulation, trade, and technological advancement. Those are the three drivers of economic growth. Those are the three things that can transform societies materially. But we saw what the fiat standard does to capital accumulation, and it's not good. 
And we saw what it does to trade. And it's also not good. It makes trade a much more complicated business because of the calculation problem and because of the trade protectionism and because your buying of goods now starts threatening the country's balance of payment, even though it's your own money and you want to buy things with it. But it's also a threat to the, your own country's balance of payment. And then finally, technological advancement, which to a very, degree, very large degree depends on imports, is also heavily um, uh, hampered by this kind of monetary standard, which is constantly placing barriers on trade and barriers on uh, movement of capital, and therefore barriers on the movement of technology and the import of technology. In fact, um, it's, it's probably, I, I think it might, uh, uh, it, it might be fair to say that really the countries that became known as the developing countries were the ones that had not imported modern industrial technology before the fiat standard came into being. And so if you, you know, if you look at the countries that had imported modern industrial technology, they were generally Western European countries and the Western offshoots that had good connections to England and Northwest Europe. Places that were close to that had managed to get a lot of that technology in before 1914. And because of that, you know, they benefited from it. But then after 1914, moving capital around became much, much more complicated, much more expensive. And as a result, um, it became far harder for these poor countries to, ac to acquire the technology that would be needed for them to develop and to grow economically. But it's OK because Bitcoin <laughs> fixes this. Really, for me, I think the, 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 the real, uh, this, this is really why uh, Bitcoin is such a big deal. Because the problem it fixes you know, more than just a cheaper, faster visa. It's not going to be a cheaper, faster visa. I'm sorry to break it to any B cashers that had the misfortunes of walking in today. But Bitcoin is not here to compete with PayPal. Bitcoin is a much bigger, uh, is a much bigger solution to a much bigger problem, which is the influence, really, of money and the state. The idea that the state controls all of society's money. That's really what Bitcoin is. Only working alternative to central banks and government-enforced banking monopolies. This is, I think, a, a, a very important point that doesn't get repeated often, even though I try and repeat it every time. But um, you know, before 2009, you couldn't send money legally outside of your country without going through your central bank. After 2009, you can. And just from a purely technological perspective, this is, this is the technological breakthrough. This is it. We used to have to go through political and legal institutions in order to send money from one country to the other. We had to have central banks that had treaties with one another, and we had to have you know, certain protocols and certain laws and certain things that needed to be abided by. And now that has all been um, essentially obsoleted by the creation of Bitcoin, which is just a form of, um, which, which makes international payments a technological problem rather than a political and, and, and legal problem. And I think this is an enormously, enormously important um, technological breakthrough. You know, we've gone from something requiring, well, it didn't really require it. If you, um, at, from the government's perspective, they would say that it does require it, but I would say it's more accurate that it was more vulnerable to legal and uh, political intervention. But now it's, uh, it's possible to get around all of these, um, all of these legal and uh, um, and um, and political rationales for it. And so, essentially, Bitcoin neuters governments by making the government-enforced banking monopolies obsolete. It becomes very hard to enforce a monopoly. Well, not very hard; it's still being enforced, but it becomes easier for people to break out of that monopoly when there is an alternative available. And that's what Bitcoin does. And it's, you know, this, Bitcoin is really valuable in this regard because it is decentralized. Whereas physical gold, the physical clearance of it requires it to be centralized. And that, therefore, makes it very vulnerable to uh, being taken over by political and uh, legal institutions. And so when you combine that with the fact that Bitcoin is hard money, it's money whose supply cannot be inflated, and you think, on the other hand, that GBM, government-enforced banking monopoly currencies, are built to be inflated and devalued to finance your local cryptocracy. That really creates a fundamental asymmetry in that Bitcoin is built to increase in value over time because its supply is fixed. Government money is built to decrease in value over the time because how else is your local kleptocrat going to build his sixth palace? And so that really, the, just the pure economics of scarcity of it make it make Bitcoin much more likely to hold on to value over time and to appreciate. And 
it really, the, the beautiful thing about it is that Bitcoin doesn't need people to be ideologically or politically motivated for it to succeed. You know, we don't need everybody to become an anarchist in order to support Bitcoin. Um, we will just watch as all the non-anarchists go broke and laugh at them. <laughs> you know, if you, if you like your government's money, feel free to keep using it. Um, it's just going to continue to uh, lose in value while the other money continues to appreciate in value. And of course, people may pretend to like their government, but really they like having money much more than they like their government, no matter what they tell you. And so over time, you know, it, it, it is a serious threat to the status quo because of this, because it's apolitical, it's technological, and it allows you to exit from the system that is built essentially to finance government at your expense. Uh, that is basically all for me. Thank you very much again. Um, I'm now an independent scholar. I've left my job at the university and I'm teaching and writing only on my website, safedean.com. So you can join it and see uh, my economics courses that you can download and uh, watch in full. <laughs> Um, in video or in audio, as well as the class notes. The Bitcoin standard is now out in 11 languages, these 11, and it'll soon be translated into these six uh, languages. It'll be out soon, and uh, thank you very much. qualche domanda, se le avete prima volevo solo ricordarvi che se volete acquistare eh, la traduzione italiana di Bitcoin Standard dovete andare da Francesco, fatti vedere e chiedere a lui. Domande? Thank you, thank you for your presentation. My pleasure, thank uh, you. In 2007, Lehman Brothers collapsed and government bailed out. When government will collapse, especially U.S., do you think climate change can be uh, the excuse to, to force people to get over the money since, you know, uh, government assume need, need to collapse? The excuse for what? Uh, climate change, to, uh, the excuse to take money from people since, you know, yeah. that can be a very valid yeah, there, there are always excuses. Uh, I mean, yeah, there are always... Uh, the governments and their universities are very good at coming up for reasons why you shouldn't have your own money and they should have it. Um, so don't expect them to stop anytime soon. But I think what is different now is that we have an exit. We, ha we have an option. Um, we have a way of um, uh, exiting it. So it's, uh, it's ultimately, you know... When the more that governments are expropriating their citizens right now, the more they are likely to drive them to try alternatives. And still, Bitcoin is still tiny, and it's nowhere near significant enough to bring down uh, governments, particularly large governments. But um, if it continues to grow, it can become uh, a, a serious threat in the same way that you know, the dollar is a threat to the Venezuelan uh, currency because people will exit the Venezuelan currency to the dollar. In, in, in that same way, you know, Bitcoin can be a threat to um, other governments, I think, in the long run. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, I heard one of the, I don't know if you know the podcast, uh, What Bitcoin Did. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the podcasts that uh, really struck my attention is uh, one by, uh, I don't remember the, guy, the name of the guy, but basically the concept was Bitcoin works for something that the system does not take care of. Mm -hmm. So the ancestral part of it, uh, the fact that the stock market, so whatever you want to call it. So I wonder, uh, I buy it. Mm. Well, I think, thank you, thank you. I, th I think I agree on, on the idea that Bitcoin is really to do things that are subversive, but I think the most important subversive thing that Bitcoin allows you to do is not buying drugs or uh, 
any of the things, of these other sort of criminal things, it's saving. That's the most subversive thing that you can do. You know, your government has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of your money on propaganda, propagandizing you into not saving and into accepting inflation and into thinking that it's normal that you would just witness your money lose value and that you would have to invest in order to maintain the value of your money and that this is necessary for the economy to grow. Um, of course, the reality is that you know, they needed the inflation to finance themselves, and then they came up with the justifications for it, um, pretending that it's uh, better economically. But in reality, I think this is the really most important uncensorable transaction that Bitcoin can allow you to do. And in a sense, it's, um, it's a victimless crime, that nobody is hurt from you being able to hold on to your value, um, except the criminals who are taking away your value from you without your consent. And so it's the hardest crime to stop, in a sense, because, well, um, you know, people think, well, Bitcoin is powerful because it allows for drugs, but I, I don't really think that is the case because, you know, chain analysis, um, it, it can discover it. You know, you're using, you're using an immutable ledger, and it's, you know, technical competence in Bitcoin is always going to be an adversarial thing. Like, so uh, people who know Bitcoin better than you might be able to figure out your transactions, might be able to trace your transactions, um, so it's, it's I, I, you know, I, I highly recommend against using Bitcoin for criminal purposes because, uh, you know, first rule of crime school is don't commit a crime on a ledger that is shared by tens of thousands of computers all over the world. Like just first step, you know, don't leave a trace on tens of thousands of computers all over the world. If you want to commit crime, use the criminal's currency of choice always, the U.S. dollar, you know, that's ideal for this. And, you know, this is, where, this is what the real criminals do. Like, okay, some people have bought weed with um, Bitcoin, but, you know, the cartels are not using Bitcoin. They're using HSBC and JP Morgan and the, <laughs> the big shots. The, when it comes to real money laundering and real crime money, Bitcoin has no chance of competing against uh, this establishment monopoly because they control the regulations and they have the ability to um, essentially shape the rules to their own benefit. And they have the ability to create money. That's the other thing. So if you're, you know, if you're HSBC or Deutsche Bank, you can create money in Germany and in Mexico and in the U.S. and um, you know, issue loans and repay loans. And that allows you a lot of flexibility, which Bitcoin, unfortunately, doesn't have. Well, fortunately, if you ask me. So I think really the, 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 the um, Bitcoin is subversive in a way that is much more than just uh, facilitating crime. I don't think it's good for facilitating crime. And a lot of people are in jail because they thought Bitcoin is good for crime because they read an article in the newspaper that had a picture of a guy with a mask uh, accessing a computer and they thought, oh, wow, I'll just go to Coinbase, give them my passport, take the coins and then send them to my drug dealer and nobody will know. And now those people are in jail. So, you know, the, I think the only crime you should do with Bitcoin is saving. And I, I think it's the most powerful crime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you, the ballot box, and you said that uh, during the gold standard, we have uh, more entrepreneurs and government making more investment for people because of a better time preference. You say, right? And how we could apply uh, a new gold standard or a Bitcoin standard, and how the nation could apply it? And do you believe that we could have an economic resurgence because of this? So just to be clear, I don't, I, I don't say in my book that governments invested more. Um, I, I'm pretty sure governments spend much more uh, now. Governments don't invest in general. Nothing government spends on is investment. It's, uh, it's, it's spending. If it was investment, it wouldn't need to be taken at gunpoint from people. People would invest it themselves. Uh, but I think the, 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 the aspects I mentioned are just the innovation, which I think is related to the time preference, the lower time preference, and the availability of capital. And I think this is really a, a very important point when we go to number 11 and think about everybody being in debt. So the economic, you know, the, the economic implication of everybody's in debt is, okay, everybody needs to pay more in the future. But if you think about the psychological implications on people of being in debt, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's prevalent in all cultures that when you're in debt, you don't sleep well. You hear this story all over. And that, you know, you don't own your time. You, you can't go to bed in peace. You wake up in the morning and there's 
a burden on top of your head because you want to work to finish so that you can pay your debt off and then you can be free. And, you know, I think people who are in that mentality are much less likely to be um, innovative than people who have their own capital, who have their own savings. And in a system in which money is ha a hard asset, in which money is not debt, the incentive is to accumulate more of that money. And so people end up with savings that allow them the peace of mind to um, be creative, but also not just in the sense of peace of mind, just basic, you know, I, I like to keep using the example of the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers were two bicycle shop owners. They had a shop for bicycles. And in their spare time, using their accumulated capital, they could try and make an airplane work. And there was nothing unique about them. There were many, many hundreds of people who were trying to make airplanes work all over the world. And uh, the fact that they could make it was because, you know, having savings allows you much more of a margin of freedom to experiment. You can buy equipment and you can um, try things out. Now, compare that to the current system where everyone is in debt and everybody needs to keep working to pay off their debt. Plus, this system also leads to the, as, as I mentioned in the book, the, you know, the growth of larger institutions. And so everybody, you know, we don't have bicycle shops now. We have giant conglomerates that make bicycles and everybody's an employee. And so the Wright brothers today would be two employees in the giant bicycle company that are in debt and have a mortgage to pay and, you know, have all of these um, debt problems that we see. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it, it's, uh, it's very hard to make these kind of predictions um, uh, and to treat them like scientific statements, but I would expect that a world in which we go back to a hard monetary standard rather than a debt-based monetary standard would witness more and more innovation. I wanted to ask a question regarding the previous, uh, the previous question. So we talked about that Bitcoin lies in several technology. One of these is the immutable ledger, and that people are likely to use it for uh, uh, to do some, to do their interest that might open the world from government. Okay, but don't you think that the fact that the, most of the time the interest diverges from the government? Okay, sure. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the book. No problem. Do you think that the weaponization of the dollar uh, trade war is negative to the trade policy and uh, might potentialize the adoption by the United States? And if it gets to do yes, which Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Blacklisting, whitelisting. Which government will have more and custodianship? Okay. So when it comes to the governments, I think, um, I think and I hope that the answer will be none. I hope governments will be the last people to get Bitcoin. And I'm quite optimistic about it because if you work in a central bank, you only got there by truly believing all the Keynesian ideas about money and truly believing the notion of money as a creation of the state. And it's going to take you a lot of time to get over that and understand that there is this thing that is money outside of the state. So hopefully, central banks and central bankers individually will be the last people to ever get into uh, Bitcoin. Um, now, I think those two questions are probably related on, in terms of fungibility. Uh, you know,
quite unpopular opinion I have on Bitcoin, I think, is that uh, Bitcoin, the idea that we can have privacy on chain just may end up not being feasible uh, technically and technologically. And uh, I, I understand the idea that it might be necessary for Bitcoin to operate um, and in order to prevent political attacks against Bitcoin. But I think we need to, be dist need to distinguish between that and between uh, whether there is actually demand for on-chain uh, privacy. And I think that's not necessarily the case. I, I did a poll on my Twitter a few weeks ago in which I asked, uh, imagine hypothetically speaking, somebody manages to uncover every identity behind every Bitcoin address. And so from now on, you know that the entire world can check all of your Bitcoin balance and they will see every single transaction in real time tied to your identity and there's no way there's no technological way of hiding this. So it's almost like your, your, every address you belong to will have a picture of you and your, all of your information. And I said, if it's the case, what would you do? Would you uh, dump all of your Bitcoin or would you sell some of your Bitcoin? Would nothing change or would you buy more Bitcoin? And I think it was about 87% who said uh, do nothing or buy more Bitcoin. And if you think about it, you know, we, we, okay, this is a Twitter poll, but in real life, you know, we know that about a quarter at least of all Bitcoin are held by KYC exchanges. So a quarter of all Bitcoin are held by people who have their passports or their driver's license attached to second layer solutions. Whereas on the first layer, particularly as, you know, if you think about it, because of the limitations on scaling the first layer, you know, um, okay, we, we have all these scaling solutions that can be introduced, but let's be realistic. Bitcoin is nowhere near ever coming uh, close to having all transactions on chain. I mean, only completely delusional B cashers think that you have to have your coffee transaction transmitted to the entire planet and that everybody will be running a node that has everybody else's coffee and all of these transactions on chain. There's no need for it. It's complete overkill in terms of security. You know, your coffee is worth three euros. You know, it only needs to be secure enough that you can attack it with 100 euros. It, you know, if there's a way to attack, the, to falsify the transaction that costs 100 euros, that's probably good enough, right? The, the, the coffee shop is willing to take the risk and you're willing to take the risk if, if the cost of attack is, is that much higher because who's gonna spend 100 euros to um, take three euros? And so, you know, we, we can be, um, we, we can be, uh, the purest uh, about it, but practically speaking, I think the demand for uncensorable transactions is a very tiny fraction of the demand for um, hard money, demand for number go up, you know, just the idea. Th that's, I think, what's really th the driver. And so, given this, it might be that on-chain transactions are more useful and will end up being utilized primarily for settlement between nodes rather than uh, for individual transactions. And so in this kind of situation, actually on-chain privacy is not something that you would care about. In fact, you would want the opposite. So imagine a world in which we have, say, 100,000 full Bitcoin nodes, each one acting as a final, uh, as a central bank, effectively able to settle transactions, and each one of them having an account for a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of people, essentially covering the entire planet. Imagine a world in which Bitcoin is the only money left well, in that world, I would like it if I could see all of the balances of all of my bank on chain. And then I would see all of the transactions of my bank. And then I could, if I wanted to invest in a bank or if I wanted to put my money in it, I could see their financial statements and I could have it run against their uh, addresses and see how their actions on uh, their transactions on chain. So it might be that, you know, having the final, the, the, uh, the, the chain layer being completely transparent so that the ownership of all coins is well known, it might actually not be such a bad idea because uh, privacy can be trivially built on second layer solutions. I think this, this is um, it's not a very popular thing to say because there's the idea that you know, Bitcoin needs to be uh, free of trusted third parties, but you know, the reality is, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, we'd like to use things for all sorts of things, but just because I'd like to use a trustless uh, payment mechanism for my coffee, it doesn't mean that I will be able to get it because I will be bidding for it with others who will be bidding for it. And so if I want to pay for a three euro coffee, uh, 
you know, the transaction fee that I'm going to be willing to pay is nothing like the transaction fee that it will be paid by a central bank for Milan settling with another city, you know, settling tens of thousands of transactions per day with one on-chain transaction. They'll be able to pay a much higher transaction fee. And there's a limit to how many transactions we can have on-chain. So, uh, you know, uh, this is, economists are always unpopular and expect this to make me more and more unpopular. Uh, but, uh, you know, the world doesn't owe you trustless transactions uh, for your coffee. And currently, you have to bid for block space. And currently, block space is pretty cheap. But don't expect that to continue to last. And if the price goes up and we don't find a way to scale Bitcoin to have uh, billions of transactions per day on chain, and spoiler alert, don't count on it, then your coffee is going to be outbid um, for second layer solutions. Yeah, and there was. Uh, yeah, custodianship. Yeah, custodianship. Yeah. Question, sorry, I took three, but uh, we only have time for one. And uh, then we're going to disappoint the idea we can't see it. What do you guys think? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think uh, it's it's hard to say, but I think it's uh, it's more likely that we'll tend toward more consensual uh, versions of welfare. You know, the, the idea then that we'll have more things like charity and more things like uh, uh, you know. Um, a direct connection between the giver and the receiver rather than just uh, a mindless bureaucracy that uh, is constantly handing out money because it doesn't face opportunity costs. And I think, you know, if, if welfare agencies had to work for their money, had to demonstrate the value to people, you know, they, they, they'd be far more effective than if they don't have to. And I think that applies to any kind of organization. Whether it means the end or not, I, I don't, so I, I don't really, I mean, we'll always have charity in one form or the other. So um, if, if, if that's what you mean by the end, then no. But in terms of maybe government-financed coercive welfare payments, potentially, possibly, yes. But again, I don't have a crystal ball, so we'll see. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>